Kiss kiss. Hello. Let's hear it for mushrooms. Oh, I guess I'll be here. Right? Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Sanchez. I am the, the official, unofficial uh, master of ceremonies, I guess when, when John Summer's not here. Um, and I'm, I'm a past president. I've been involved with CMS for, for a while and, and very fortunate to, to have an organization like this. So thank you all for coming. Uh, any newcomers? Any, any first timers here? Take a look around. That's, that's good to see. Welcome and, and keep coming back. Um, if you're interested in past talks, uh, our YouTube channel, you can find um, probably everything for the last couple of years, I believe. So a lot of good things. And you'll see a familiar face from COVID years. That, that was the, uh, the virtual fair that we had that year that uh, Andy Wilson was, was, uh, was, uh, uh, took on and, and, and carried it through. Um, so before we officially start, I do have some, some uh, club announcements. Um, but I also have a, a poem I want to I want to start with, and uh, this this uh, anthology is, uh, is is all about it's all fungal fungi inspired poems called decomposition, and so um, kind of had a tradition of sorts to a uh, um, a poem before we before we start just to set the tone. All right, so I found one because we're in the season we're we're approaching the season for morels here in Colorado. And this one's called Morel Mushrooms by Jane Whitridge. Softly they come, thumbing up from the firm ground, protruding unharmed, easily crumble, and yet how they shoulder the leaf and mold aside, rising unperturbed, breathing obscurely, still as stone. By the slumping log, by a dappled aspen, they grow alone. A dumb eloquence seems their trade. Like hooded monks in the sacred wood, they say, tomorrow we are gone. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so just to kind of get things started, um, anybody seen the latest edition of National Geographic? April is fungi on the cover. I think this marks the first time that uh, mushrooms have ever graced the, the cover of of National Geographic, and so this uh, issue deals with a lot of different mushroom-connected themes. So if, if you're out and about and you see this, check it out. You know, good old National Geographic is is representing us, and uh, and, and I'm glad I'm glad to see that. Some really cool photos as well. So um, I would well, probably have to defer to Andy. I I think Courtney Harris maybe, or, or Ed. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this one, Ed. Oh, really? Ooh. So, so different versions. Did you buy it here in Colorado? Um, this I found it at Barnes and Noble. So, I, so maybe the subscri subscription edition is a little bit different. So, because I, I saw one online that was that, that had morels as well, but uh, this one's a little bit different. Um, but nonetheless, m mushrooms are are making their presence in in. Uh, and, and, and we're, we're thankful. I mean, this, this this club has been around for over 50 years, and, and you know, continues to uh, educate and to help people learn more about what we need to learn about, and, and, and that being mushroom. Um, a couple of quick announcements as far as the club. Uh, John Summer wanted me to, to mention a few things. Uh, those of you who are interested in taking some of the mushroom classes that we've offered um, in July and August, registration is going to open May 1st. <laughs> So May 1st, um, first come, first serve, and they do fill up pretty quickly, but if you are interested, pay attention to the club website and you'll find information about that. Uh, but May 1st is when you can start registering for some of the classes that will be, that'll be taken in July and August. And has anybody taken the classes in those? Good, good experience? On, on, and, and so part of, part of the class also involves field uh, going out in the field and, and, and collecting. And, and so um, if you're new and you want to learn more, th those are excellent opportunities to learn from uh, very experienced teachers and, um, and to go out and find stuff. Um, the other thing uh, for May, and, and if you're seeing this on the website, that the information's there. I know we've got a lot of good talks in the next few months. But our May speaker, Paxton Hogue, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his, his name right, uh, but he discovered uh, Psilocybe azurescence. 
and uh, is a 40-year researcher in, in the topic of psilocybe. And, and so it should be really interesting, especially being in Colorado, there's a lot of new changes that are coming. So next month um, should be a good one as well. All right. So from here, I, it, it's my honor to introduce our guest. Um, I, I first came across him, I probably in Instagram, I would say, when I first Hi. saw you. And, uh, and I know you, you did some work with, um, uh, with our fair, our virtual fair. Uh, uh, Gary Hefferly, um, I'm pronouncing that right? Yep. Okay. Uh, he is a commercial grower. Um, you can find some of his products at, at local farmer's market. I think you said Castle Rock Farmer's Market this year? Yep. And, and he'll mention more about some of the other opportunities for that. Um, but, but he also offers cultivation classes, which, which is very helpful for people who want to learn how to, how to grow, all right? And so um, he's got a huge presence on social media. I, I was looking at his YouTube channel, he has 40 some thousand subscribers at, at last count I saw. So it, it's good to see that uh, you're getting a following. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy to see it. So we are very fortunate to, to have him uh, speak for us tonight about growing gourmet mushrooms. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So thank you, Gary. Oops. Uh, we have another Okay. And so those of you on Zoom, if, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we will uh, we'll, we'll deal with those as they as they come. So, all right. Well thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, like Greg said, I'm Gary Hefferly and I own a very small gourmet mushroom farm in Sedalia, Colorado. So it's not Salida, it's about 40 minutes south of here um, between Castle Rock and Highlands Ranch. Um, so I would like to thank all of you guys for coming out here. Uh, usually I just talk to the airwaves on YouTube, so it's definitely a lot different talking to you guys in person. But um, there's a few ways that I could have gone about this talk. Normally I teach this whole course in two days and it's very hands-on, but um, John kind of guided me to kind of dial it back into more of just a global perspective on growing mushrooms. So I'm gonna cover maybe like three different philosophies of growing mushrooms. So one being indoor cultivation, like what I do, and then um, as more of like a hobbyist grower, maybe you want to just do more like gardening. That's kind of how I started. So planting mushrooms in your garden, or there's like a third type or philosophy of cultivating mushrooms on logs. So using like pl plug spawn. So that's kind of the gist of this talk. Um, so this is a picture of our new um, 1500 square foot facility in Sedalia. So we started this construction back in COVID. So my wife and I, we purchased some property in Sedalia and we were living in Denver. And I started my mushroom farm kind of as a hobby in my basement. And then slowly it evolved over the past seven years. And I've grown and sold about 20,000 pounds of gourmet mushrooms out of my basement, which is kind of crazy to talk about. But this is me. Um, about 13 years ago. So my background is in medical technology. Um, this was a picture of me. I was doing genetic work at Buffalo, New York, um, Buffalo General Hospital. I was doing some karyotyping and that was towards the end of uh, my college career. And back in May 2012, uh, my wife and I, we took a road trip all over the country in my Jeep Wrangler and we ended up staying in Glenwood Springs for a few nights and we really fell in love with Colorado. So that October, we moved across the country and I worked in a, a tissue culture lab in Centennial and we made medical products using stem cells. So that's kind of my tissue culture experience. Um, I did that for a few years and then I uh, joined this company called Native Roots, um, one the cannabis industry became legal here in Colorado. So I took my tissue culture experience and applied it to plants. 
And for anyone who's interested, plant tissue culture is very similar to mushroom cultivation. So being an avid gardener, um, I kind of like collected a bunch of lab equipment for doing plant tissue culture. And then maybe about 10 years ago, I tried to grow mushrooms. So um, I also uh, completed this book, Growing Gourmet Mushrooms for Market, two years ago. So if you're interested, this is a very detailed outline of all of my processes, um, all, everything I'm gonna talk about today, but just really dialed in. There's a bunch of links to different products that I use. And um, yeah, if you wanna check out my website, it's freshfromthefarmfungi.com. But basically I started off growing mushrooms in my garden. Maybe about seven years ago, I, uh, I posted an ad on Craigslist. I was growing tons and tons of lion's mane mushrooms. Uh, my wife and I, we were eating mushrooms like every day. So uh, um, it was at that moment though, someone drove their bike from Lakewood all the way to our house in Denver and they pulled up to the front door. I had maybe like three pounds of lion's mane and he looked at it, he grabbed one of them and ate it like an apple. And like, I was like, no, you're supposed to cook these. But anyway, that was the, the moment that clicked where I'm like, there's a market for these mushrooms. People are very health conscious here. And that started fresh from the farm fungi. Okay, so as a cultivator, um, one important aspect is what is the goal of mushroom farming? So the main goal is to produce high quality, nutritious mushrooms in a repeatable and sustainable manner. So anyone who's ever tried to grow mushrooms for the first time, um, it's very common to fail. Uh, my first ever experience was I bought these uh, spores off of Amazon, or it, they called them spores, but in reality it was a, a grain spawn. They showed up super dried out. I didn't know what I was doing, so I planted them in a pot like seeds, and then I covered it with some plastic, and maybe three weeks later, I finally saw some fuzz like come to the surface, and then the next morning it was all green, and it was trichoderma. So very disheartening, but at the same time, my personality was to double down. So I did a ton of research. I went down the rabbit hole. Um, there was lots of forums and Facebook groups that I spent a lot of time to kind of procure this information. And eventually I was able to produce mushrooms. So the, the key to growing mushrooms is to reproduce nature in a controlled environment. So that could be a tote under your bed or that could be a very sophisticated grow room. Um, but all of these principles you can apply to most types of mushrooms um, and you can kind of scale them to your liking. Okay, so the basic mushroom life cycle. So this um, is a, a false morel and it's sporulating. So that's kind of the, the whole life cycle captured in one, one picture. But basically a mushroom will start off as a single spore in nature and it will land on a surface that has the correct moisture content um, and then that spore will germinate as a, a haploid or um, a, a, a monokaryonic cell so it has half the gene and it will extend hyphae which are kind of like this, uh, this long stringy substance which once a, a a haploid finds another compatible haploid, it will form one um, diploid cell, which is called mycelium. That mycelium will extend and it will cover the surface of the substrate, and then it will exude um, compounds that will break up the substrate so that it, it could absorb the nutrients, and then it will fully colonize that substrate, and in nature, um, oftentimes it will rain or the temperatures will drop to condense the moisture in the air and that will trigger pinning. So pinning is kind of the, uh, the formation of that mycelium into a fruiting body. And then over the course of a day or two, um, that mushroom will kind of uh, absorb water through the mycelium and it will blow up like a balloon and produce fruiting bodies. 
So that's what happens in nature. It's kind of remarkable when you think about it that the, a little microscopic spore um, will land on a substance and find another mated pairing to form mushrooms. And that is kind of like the mysterious nature about fungi in general. Is I think it's a miracle that it can happen in nature, let alone in a, like a highly sophisticated lab. So when you're, when you're farming mushrooms, the challenge is to um, get repeatable results in an efficient way and avoid contaminants. So when you're cultivating mushrooms indoor, there's a lot of other fungi or bacteria that also like that environment. So aseptic technique is very important and we'll talk about that later. But I think that um, if you compare it to nature, when you're growing mushrooms, one of the most important things is to get really good genetics. So um, my passion these days has been kind of breeding mushrooms. So if anyone's interested after the talk, I brought in some cordyceps that I've been breeding over the past couple years now. Um, but I also sell genetics on my um, Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi. But essentially you want to get really purified mushroom strains in order to be able to reproduce those over time. So that comes in the form of liquid culture or petri dishes or spores is a different option. Um, so then you'll take those genetics and produce spawn. So it kind of can accelerate exponentially at this point, um, which is really good when you're growing food. But so from the spawn, you'll transfer it to a substrate, which that's just imagine um, like a spongy material that the mushroom grows on that also provides nutrients. So that can be sawdust, which is the case in my farm. It can also be straw. Um, you can use a lot of agricultural waste, which is a really powerful aspect of growing mushrooms. You can use soy hulls, um, alfalfa. Here in Colorado, I've grown oyster mushrooms on hemp herd. Um, it was almost free, so you can take a free waste product from agriculture and turn it into nutritious food. Um, so that's the substrate aspect. A lot of other mushrooms, um, like portobellos and button mushrooms, they will grow on compost. So that's a different type of mushroom, but it's the same idea. Okay, so I guess the next phase after you're growing the mycelium on the substrate is to get it to pin. So like I said before, um, what happens in nature is that it will rain, the temperature will drop, uh, evaporation occurs, and then that will force the mushrooms into pinning. However, when you're working inside of a building, it can get a little tricky. So for um, this process, I will grow the mushrooms in bags and then I'll cut little slits in the bag and that exposure to air will cause them to pin. Um, okay, and then I guess the last part is harvesting your fruiting bodies. So mushrooms grow very rapidly. They'll, they'll go from the size of a little pin, maybe like a, a half an inch to the full flush like that in maybe like 72 hours. So keeping up with um, your harvest cycle is very important, especially when you're thinking about, you know, how many mushrooms you wanna grow in this, in this size of space. Okay, so this next slide is going to talk about how we do this. So I, I kind of touched on the mushroom spawn or culture. So it's very important to get good genetics. Um, having, you know, I think that there's a few really reputable com companies in America. North Spore is a really good one. Field and Forest. Um, Mycelium Emporium is very popular. Um, I would recommend my genetics personally because they're kind of procured in Colorado. But getting really, really good genetics is important because it's gonna help you battle any contaminants or any fluctuations in the environment, which early on, um, there's a big learning curve. Okay, so then I talked about um, the colonization of the substrate and aseptic technique. So I'll, I'll kind of move on to this slide. So this is the types of starting cultures. So on the left there, you'll see 
um, the mycelium that is growing on a petri dish filled with agar. So this is kind of the most basic way to grow mushrooms. Um, the petri dish acts as like a three-dimensional filter. So the, the benefit is that if you have mushroom mycelium growing on the surface of a petri dish plate, it will only grow in two directions. So that reveals any contaminants that might be on that dish. So um, it, it verifies that it's a clean and healthy mycelium to start with, and that will help take care of a lot of questions later on. So then I think about 10 years ago, um, according to the shroomery, the, like one of the most famous mushroom forums, the introduction of liquid culture was made. So liquid culture is just a liquid broth. So I use a 4% honey water and it contains polysaccharides and different sugars that the mushroom needs to survive, but it's in a liquid form. And this allows for the mycelium to expand rapidly. So you can see um, this jar in the top right corner here. That is a, about a half gallon jar of liquid culture. When I take, it could be as little as two cells of mycelium, so just a little scrape off the Petri dish, I'll put it into that jar and then agitate it with a stir bar. And in about four or five days, I'll have enough liquid culture to generate a thousand pounds of mushrooms. So it's a very fast and efficient way to start a, a, a mushroom farm, I would say. But there are some drawbacks. Um, compared to the Petri dish, you can't really see if it's contaminated or not. So if you're going to start with liquid culture, just be aware you want to get it from a reliable source and you want to um, kind of uh, be cautious about it because you don't know if it's contaminated or not until you're kind of already growing. So I would say the easiest way is the Petri dish because you can verify that it's clean the liquid culture is very efficient. And then the third way to start a mushroom farm is the, uh, the spore print. So on the bottom left, um, spores are produced by the mushroom when they're mature in their fruiting phase. So like this picture here, you can essentially make a spore print by taking that mushroom, putting it on a clean piece of paper, or I like to use a Petri dish. So I'll just take a blank Petri dish put a mushroom in there, cover it with a bowl, and let it drop its spores for about 10 or 12 hours. Then you can take the bowl off and then take the mushroom off and you will um, have a spore print remaining. So that is the genetic starting point. You can kind of uh, compare it to a seed for a plant. So there are drawbacks to starting with spores though. So they're pretty variable. Um, compared to a tissue sample like a petri dish or a liquid culture, you're not gonna get the same exact mushroom, but when you're breeding mushrooms like me, it's kind of exciting because there's a chance you can get a one-off um, like phenotype or a one-off variant from what you were growing to begin with. So there are reasons that you could use spores, but a lot of people get confused when they buy spores and then they put them into a grain spawn because all those spores will be competing against each other and you won't get as good of results if, as if you started from an isolated culture. So the fourth type of starting culture is a, a slant. So often if you buy your samples from a reputable like tissue bank like ATCC in Pennsylvania, they'll send you a slant or um, if you buy a culture from Paul Stamets, oftentimes you can buy like a slant, which is the mother culture. So it's the original culture. It's, uh, it's very secure and it hasn't experienced what is called senescence. So if you keep using the same culture over and over, it will eventually break down and kind of die out. So there's a value in a slant culture. So for my farm, I will, um, breed mushrooms from spores, isolate a single culture, make a bunch of slants of that, and then every year I'll just take my mushroom from the mother culture slant and expand it from there. 
and that way I get really repeatable, repeatable results over time. Um, <laughs> okay, so after the original culture, um, there's a few options you can go. So this is called spawn. So spawn is basically the, the carrying uh, mechanism from the pure mycelium into the bulk substrate. So on this slide, uh, I have pictured uh, sawdust spawn. So if you're thinking about doing a garden or um, just planting mushrooms in the ground, sawdust spawn is a really good way to do it because um, sawdust itself is kind of um, selective for mushrooms. So if you use grain spawn, which is in the bottom right, it's very nutritious and it's very good for growing mushrooms indoors because it's gonna give you big yields. But if you plant it outside, it's gonna be competing against um, animals, insects, uh, other fungus. So it's um, kind of important to think about what your environment is and what spawn you want to use. So the bottom left is going to be plug spawn. So I make my own plug spawn by um, cooking some wooden dowels from like furniture making. You soak them in some water for overnight, uh, pour off the water, put it in a jar, cook that jar for about 20 minutes at, uh, in a pressure cooker at 15 PSI, let it cool, and then you can add your mycelium to the plug and then um, a really easy way to grow mushrooms is you would take a hardwood log that has been freshly cut, uh, freshly cut and then you would drill a bunch of holes, uh, hammer in the plug spawn, keep it moist for about two or three months until the mycelium can colonize it and then um, you can bring it into a cool uh, damp environment that's exposed to the the elements and you'll get some mushrooms fruiting that way. So I think that that's probably the cheapest and easiest way to do it. And then um, grain spawn is over here. Uh, this is some shiitake on some grain spawn. So you can use a, a, um, a bunch of different types of grain. So I prefer oats because it's cheap and it has like an outer shell that kind of protects against contaminants, but people will often use wheat or for the cordyceps. Um, I grow these on rice. So the idea of a grain spawn is that it has a very high moisture content. So you can really blow up those grains like a balloon. And um, if you think about mushroom farming compared to other agriculture, the irrigation happens up front. So you can't really add water to mushrooms after they start to fruit. So the value behind grain spawn is that it holds all this water up front while the mushroom's still develop, developing compared to sawdust, which that will probably hold about 45 to 55% um, relative moisture compared to grains, which they can hold up to 65% moisture. So that little bit of difference will mean you know, that much more yield. Okay, so now that we talked about the starting culture, the intermediate culture, um, there's a process from going from a sterile media to a less sterile bulk substrate, and that is called inoculation. So um, this is kind of like the hands-on part of my class. You can't really learn it just by reading about it and thinking about it. You kind of have to do it hands-on. So um, that's where the process of aseptic technique comes in. But basically, once you have your spawn, you have to um, transfer it to a growth media, and you want to be able to do that without introducing contaminants from the air, like yeast or mold, or just like uh, bacteria from your breath. So in this picture um, to the left here, that's my wife, and we're taking a liquid culture that we brewed inside of a bottle, and then she's taking a sterile needle, and you can see um, there's this injection port in top, um, on top of the jar. So it's essentially like an IV that would allow for you to transfer the mycelium 
into that sterile vessel without introducing <coughs> it to the air. Uh, another tool that a lot of mushroom farms use is a flow hood. So that's a laminar flow hood that she's working in front of. It's taking the air, it's running it through a HEPA filter, and it's filtering out any potential contaminants. So these are all things to consider when you're trying to grow mushrooms. You wanna have it as sterile as possible so that um, you'll achieve the next level of growth there. Okay, so yeah, this slide kind of talks about the aseptic technique. So the goal is um, using sterile process to maintain the isolation of mushroom mycelium and prevent contamination. So you can use um, a still air box, or nowadays they make these inflatable glove boxes on Amazon for like a hundred bucks. And it basically just protects the mushroom from um, different you know, wind currents or like your breath, like I said. Okay, so this is especially important during the early process, like if you're starting from spores or from a Petri dish, and then as the mushroom develops, kind of um, gains immunity and it gains strength where it can defend itself against contaminants. Okay, so um, this kind of, um, kind, kind of stepping back from the actual process of mushrooms is the, the space that you want to be able to grow. So I would say all of the techniques that you can grow mushrooms require some kind of a lab space or clean space. So this can be like a glove box, like I said, but um, this right here is my lab up top. I have a, a flow hood that I do all my culture work in, and then I have another incubator that after I do my Petri dish work, it maintains the sterility, um, and then there's a stainless steel tables that are easy to clean. Um, this lower picture, I'm showing you the injection ports that make it easy for you to take a needle and just um, kind of expand your mushroom cultures. So the less you have to handle your mushroom um, spawn, the better, the more success you're gonna have. Okay, so then after you, you inoculate your spawn or your bulk substrate, you're going to have to have an incubation phase. So um, if I was doing this as a hobby still, I would probably consider a closet a good incubation space. It's gonna be dark, it's gonna be relatively stable environment, and it's gonna be free from you know other contaminants getting in there. And then one of the most important aspects is that it has to be easily observable. So um, mushrooms grow very rapidly things can get out of hand very quickly. So if you don't observe your mushrooms every day, um, then problems can happen. So if you ever do see um, you know, a green spot or a, like a, a oily substance on the bottom of your spawn, it's probably contamination. So you should take that, um, isolate it, watch it, and then if it's you know continues to get worse, then you can compost it, but you want to remove it from your incubation space. So having protection from contaminants and also protection from direct light. So mushrooms, they typically grow in the undergrowth. They don't like direct UV lights. So these are all considerations when you're thinking about the space to grow. Okay, so now from this point on, the mushrooms start as a culture, then they develop into spawn, and then you have this bulk substrate, and it can kind of divert in different directions at this point. So you can either grow in outdoor garden beds, like uh, that top right picture, um, which is, I, I'm growing Kinstroferia, so they tend to grow well in just a garden environment, um, outdoor on logs, like this picture in the top left here, or indoor in a controlled environment. So essentially up until this point, it's the same, but then once you get to the point of um, actually fruiting the mushrooms, that's kind of where you can differentiate the technique. So I really love um, growing Kingstroferia in garden beds. I've grown it with squash, corn, um, tomatoes, 
And typically what I do is right now, I have about 30 pounds of spawn that is ready to go. And once the weather kind of um, stabilizes and it's time to plant, I would say like your early season vegetables, like um, corn is a good one. Um, I like to till the earth and then put my spawn down and make like a lasagna layer. And in this picture here, this is hemp herd that I got from a friend for free, but you can use leaves, you can use grass clippings, you can use um, straw or just any kind of uh, like a high cellulose material. And then you'll just wanna plant the spawn in layers so that over the course of the spring, the mycelium will, will thicken, and then as the plants grow, they'll provide shade, and then probably around you know late June, early July, you can get a flush. Um, it is kind of variable depending on the weather, um, but yeah, usually I'll see one or two flushes throughout the summer, and um, in my opinion, the Kingstraferia tastes very similar to a porcini, but you don't have to go out and hunt them and there's usually less bugs because you can just pick them right when they're ready. Um, but I recommend, you know, starting with Kingstraferia. Um, okay, so then I also talked about planting in logs. So it's pretty simple, but basically you take a fresh cut log, preferably hardwood. So in Colorado, I've had success with um, cottonwood and you, wanna, um, you want them freshly cut and not diseased. So there's a company called Chip Drop. If, if you guys aren't familiar, um, make sure you ha you're prepared. But basically, you can sign up for this service where local arborists in your area will put you on like a map. And when, it, when they do tree trimmings or if they have to like clear a bunch of trees, um, it's kind of indiscriminate, but they'll come to your house and drop off a big load of wood chips or sometimes they have really nice logs. So that's what I've done in the past where I've gotten really nice cottonwood logs, um, but you can also use the wood chips to grow Kingstraferia. But you would take these logs, wait maybe a week until the, uh, the, the sap inside the wood will kind of dry out, and then um, take a drill and every four inches put a, put a hole in the log and then put a colonized plug spawn in that log um, and then some people say you should seal it with wax. I think that it's unnecessary, but it will help the log kind of stay moist. Um, and then what I like to do is I'll stack the log for about three or four months really tightly together and put a tarp over it because in Colorado it's so dry that that mycelium could dry out. But after about two or three months, um, after looking and seeing the mycelium so you can kind of see the mycelium coming out of the end of that log on the left um, then it will be time to flush so you can either just drench it with a hose for you know 10 minutes and then wait and then maybe the next day do it again or you can dunk it in like a bin with water but the idea is to get that log really saturated um, and then as that log will dry out you should get pins and then um, in about two or three weeks, if you're growing shiitake like this, um, you should get a nice flush. And then the benefit of logs is that they're very like slow burning, um, so to say. So you can get years of mushrooms out of a log compared to sawdust, which breaks down really rapidly. Okay, so then the third aspect, which I kind of talked about a lot, is um, growing indoor. So these are Piapino mushrooms, and I think they're one of the easiest mushrooms to grow. You can grow them inside of a grow bag. Um, there's a company in Texas called Unicorn Bag, which they make a biodegradable plastic bag, which is pretty awesome. Um, and it has a filter patch. So you would take that bag, add your sawdust, which I use a 50-50 blend of hardwood and soy hull pellets, and then, um, I add water and cook it in a, a barrel, like a steamer for about 24 hours, let it cool, add my spawn and seal it. 
and then you don't have to do anything else but just watch it grow because the bag is kind of designed for a little bit of airflow and um, at least the strain that I bred, it will pin on its own just right on your countertop. And then once the mushrooms get to a certain size, you can just cut the bag open and harvest them. And if you preserve the integrity of the, the bag, you can kind of put the flaps back over and get about two or three more flushes like that. So I have some videos on YouTube about growing Tiafino mushrooms. I think they're the easiest to start with. Um, also oyster mushrooms, um, but yeah. So then this slide kind of shows different parameters. So if you do check out my Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, all my strains have these growing parameters which kind of go through the, the expectations for timelines um, and I think temperature, yep. And then I do have like a, a whole PDF file. If anyone w wants to email me with questions about these, I could send you all this info. But um, personally, I grow about 16 different varieties and then I rotate them throughout the year, uh, just depending on the weather. So, um, okay. Yeah, so normally, like I said before, I teach this class in like two days and it's very hands-on, but I'm kind of here to answer any questions. So I don't know if that was kind of a good overview for you guys, but um, yeah, I can, I can answer questions if anyone has more specific questions to growing mushrooms. Otherwise, um, I did have like another part of fungal ecology to talk about. But yeah, if anyone has any questions about growing mushrooms, yep. Have you been using those biodegradable bags? Have you used them? Yes. So, um, so yeah, I really like them. There are some drawbacks though. So the technology behind the biodegradable bags is that they add an additive to the plastic, which makes them vulnerable to oxygen. So as soon as you get a shipment of those bags, there's kind of like a shelf life where it's about six or eight months before you have to use them or they degrade. So I'll have to order them more often, which kind of increases the cost a little bit. But the idea is that the plastic will break down and you know I have a small compost pile where there's, it's slowly like degrading. Um, one question I always have is like, what happens when they get really small, does it become microplastics and stuff? So I haven't, I haven't like dove deep into that research, but there's a, a company called Pegasus Bags, which is one of the employees at Unicorn created this side company just based on that. And um, I also talked, or in my class, I touch on this uh, plastic eating fungi. So it's a P microspora, which um, Pegasus, bags gifted me one time and they isolated this mushroom um, in the Amazon and it breaks down polypropylene plastic or polyethylene plastic it's one of the two and that is like you know half of the plastic that they use so there are some flaws behind it but to me it's a lot better than you know the traditional plastics that they're using it's like a step towards the right direction yep yep go ahead Um, let me let me look. There's a slide I have. Okay, I was wrong. It's a uh, it breaks down polyurethane plastic, and the research that they did was in like a bioreactor, so it wasn't exposed to any oxygen. I think it was anaerobic digestion, but this is you know the forefront of these plastic eating mushrooms. I think that. They also discovered another species like maybe two years ago, and that has more promise um, as far as like being exposed to oxygen. But basically they starved this mushroom until its only option was to eat plastic, and then it broke it down. So um, I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel like it's like a step towards the right direction, but there's a lot of uh, research still being done. Yep. So just quick, you can repeat the question from Okay, yeah, yes. All right, so anyone else? Yep, um, go ahead. I, I 
simple idea. Do you know of any mushrooms that are being being developed to like target like dead fall pines and dead fall like aspens? Okay, so the question was, are there any mushrooms that are being targeted for dead fall pines and dead fall aspens? So I think personally, um, Ragusa annulata, so Strafaria, Ragusa annulata are the garden giants that has been able to break down any of those wood chip drops that I've gotten, which is, you know, 40% pine. Um, there's even like walnut in there sometimes. So I think that um, King Strafaria is like this hybrid between like a, a secondary decomposer and a primary decomposer. It's very adaptable. Um, I think that that would be a good candidate for it. I also think that oyster mushrooms, um, there was a company here grow house and they claim to exclusively use uh, softwood for their brown oyster or uh, Pleuratus austriatus maybe. Um, I don't know, one of their oyster mushrooms, they only use softwood pellets. So I think that um, the challenge for like fallen wood would be that there's like a differential or there's like a differential in the moisture content of like a, a log that's laying on the ground. So I think that breaking those down a little further or burying them so that um, that moisture content would be more stable throughout the whole log would help it break down faster. So I think that's the challenge when you have like a bunch of, uh, you know, debris piled up is that if there's too much uh, um, like surface area to the air, the mushrooms will only grow inside that log. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. If you made uh, petri dishes or slants um, at home, how long can you keep them for? Yeah, so the question was, how long can you keep petri dish or slants when you make them at home? So I think that there's a few factors in the shelf life. So the first one is, are they sterile? So what I, do as a normal procedure is when I pour my plates or make my slants, I'll leave them at room temperature for at least 72 hours. That way, if there is any contaminants while you're making them, they would reveal themselves. So that instantly eliminates, you know, however many you contaminated. So I think that starting off 50% is really good success. But nowadays, I maybe get 0.1% contamination um, so that would eliminate right off the bat then the next factor is if you use a sealed container like a slant you can potentially keep those for a decade if they're not contaminated and they don't dry out now with petri dishes there's vented petri dishes so those will naturally kind of evaporate especially with the surface area being so large but you can use um, glass Petri dishes, and as long as they're kind of sealed and you have some weight on it, those can also last for a very long time. Now, there's some media types, like, uh, like rose bangle agar, that is sensitive to light, or if you have uh, different antibiotics in your agar, it could degrade over time, but if you're just using malt extract or potato dextrose agar, it could potentially last for a very long time. Fall onto that. I mean, do you would you have to store them in the fridge, or can they be stored uh, you know, yep. room temperature or freezer or what? Okay, so the question is if you should store them in the fridge or room temperature or a freezer. So I would say not a freezer because um, when they thaw, they'll kind of get um, misshapen. A refrigerator is best practice. So any lab like that's like CLIA certified or any regulated lab. Um, the reason is that the nutrients won't degrade or like I said if there's antibiotics and stuff it will maintain the viability and if you store it in a fridge um, my recommendation is to store it upside down so it's agar side up and the reason is that when it condenses all the water will be on the lid of the petri dish so if you have condensation you could just take the dish and pour that off without getting the agar contaminated um, but that being
being said, if you keep it at room temperature, just make sure that it's like not like warm in the room. Like if you have like a 90 degree room, it's gonna cause the auger to evaporate. But if it's like 60 degrees in your room, that plate will slowly get thinner maybe over the course of a year, two years. Um, so the temperature is a factor because of evaporation. So the, the water from the auger will condense against the surface of the plate and then it will shrink that down until it's just a little film. But that could take years or decades um, just depending on the temperature. Yep, yep, go ahead. How did you get into this and how often do you do it? Yep, so the question was how did I get into uh, this or mushroom farming and how long have I done it? So if you missed the very beginning, um, it kind of started as a hobby. So I started off by trying to grow mushrooms in the garden. I remember a phone call I had with my mom one time. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna grow mushrooms in the garden. She's like, what? Like, you can't do that. And like being, like my personality is like, I'm very um, anti-authoritative, I guess. So yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try growing mushrooms in the garden, and then I completely failed, and then I started researching, and then um, on the first successful mushroom that I grew was actually from a grow kit that someone left on their porch on Craigslist. So my wife was at work one day, she's like, hey, I found this like uh, post on Craigslist. I'm like, I drove there instantly, grabbed this like, it was like a dilapidated oyster block, and then I put it in this little green, it was like a, a tent that I don't even remember, but it was like this little four foot tent and I was like spritzing it with water and eventually I just like added a humidifier and I, I got this mushroom to flush. And then maybe like two months later, I went back to New York and my dad, um, one of his friends at work, her husband had a mushroom farm in Niagara Falls. So he, his wife would always like bring in mushrooms just to give to people. And uh, it's like a very Italian culture where I'm from in Buffalo, New York. So, you know, we like mushroom lasagna and mushroom pizza. Um, it's just part of the cuisine. So I always kind of was interested. I just didn't know the cultivation aspect. And then luckily, I was there on Thanksgiving and he was like shutting down for the season. So he offered me to do a tour and I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna go. So I went and visited, I talked his ear off for like two hours and he was kind enough to just show me his whole process. Um, and then I ended up leaving with a grocery bag of mushrooms <laughs> and um, I was driving back to Colorado. So we like put ice in a cooler and I kept these mushrooms viable and then as soon as I got home, I cloned all of them. And uh, that really took it to the next level because I had like eight different strains and I was constantly like transferring them. And um, at that time, I was working with a, a lab for the uh, CDPHE. So I, I was lucky that I collected like all this lab equipment. They had like a, an old incubator and an old autoclave, like this little two foot autoclave. And I was just, you know, I'm like, you're gonna throw that out. So I started just collecting stuff. And then that was probably seven years ago now. So then I saved up a bunch of money and um, I ended up quitting that job after I started, it was uh, June in 2018. So maybe in February, I started posting mushrooms on Craigslist. And then in April, someone actually bought them and then in June, um, this lady, Christina Welch, was starting a co-op grocery store. So she saw my ad on Craigslist and was like, do you wanna sell your mushrooms here? I'm like, yeah. So then that allowed me to grow as many as I could. And then slowly, um, I kind of was selling out of mushrooms there and then I could produce more than I was selling. And then the following summer, I joined the, uh, Cherry Creek Farmers Market. So that was kind of like another like a 
break through because I can't, I couldn't plateau there. So that was maybe six years ago. And then two years ago, we built our new building. And then now I've kind of maximized that, but I'm shifting more towards uh, breeding mushrooms. And uh, I was telling Greg earlier, my, one of my goals is to like almost automate breeding. So that's kind of like my scientific background as a med tech meeting like my passion in mycology. So that's kind of the future where I'm going from the beginning. Yep. A couple of Zoom questions. Um, what, what do you do with all the spent blocks after fruit? Yep, so the question was, what do I do with all the spent blocks after fruiting? So when I first started, <laughs> I bought two tumbler um, composters and for a while I was composting my mushrooms and then I would bag it up and sell the compost. And a few years ago, the, uh, the gardening guild at one of the farmer's markets approached me and they would come and take truckloads of compost. But ever since we moved to our new facility, I have this enormous compost pile and I'm contemplating what to do with it. But right now it attracts like 50 turkeys <laughs> because <laughs> there's like, yeah, there, like the grubs that grow in there are crazy and like it's just interesting to watch but uh, I feel like it attracts lots of wildlife right now and um, my hope is to you know make raised beds and kind of garden out and then once I have a surplus I'll probably sell it to the public again or if you're interested just email um, but yeah people can come and take plenty of it but it's a good byproduct for having a mushroom farm So the question was, if you only have one fruiting chamber, what mushrooms are compatible with each other? So if I go back to this chart, uh, the text is super little, but um, I tried to like pair up mushrooms together, but I can just tell you what I do. So, um, so in the early season, like right now, I like to grow king oyster, uh, blue oyster, brown oyster, lion's mane. Um, those are like my four starters. Those all like colder temperatures. Um, and then as I drift into like summertime, I'll switch it up and I'll do like shiitake because those take longer too. So unless I started them in like December, they're not gonna be ready. And then I also do like uh, chestnut mushrooms, piapino, uh, golden oyster, pink oyster, those are very heat tolerant. And then as I switch towards like the really warm parts of summer, uh, lion's mane always thrives. So that's kind of like a all season one. Um, and then also beach mushrooms, they can handle the, the warmer temps. Um, and then I feel like I'm missing a lot, but um, so one thing that you have to think about is if you have one fruiting chamber, there's microclimates within there. So I, I even started just with one tent and I would put my lion's mane all the way at the top and then something that can handle a lot more moisture like a shiitake, you could put that right at the bottom next to the humid, humidifier. So even if you just have one fruiting chamber, try to divide it into different microclimates and just play around. But also genetics plays a big factor. Like um, some oyster mushrooms are very tolerant to CO2. So that's another factor that I didn't even talk about here. But if you keep your CO2 below a thousand PPMs, most of the mushrooms that I sell will grow fine together. Um, it just really depends on your airflow, your humidity and like the proximity of the mushrooms. Like if you squish too many close together, they might have problems. Yep. So this, this might be more of a business type question, but how, how do you manage succession planning to keep up with your market? 
Yep. So the question is, how do I manage succession planning to keep up with my market? So that is a very um, organi organizational. I don't know. Okay. So at first, I would say my bottleneck was like I, I had space problems. So just one little area of space created my bottleneck, which that kind of limited my my time. Now that I have so much space, I think labor is kind of my bottleneck. So what I do is I, I divide up my week into different portions of the grow. So Monday, I'll do my bulk sterilization. And then while that's cooling on Tuesday, I do my grain um, prep. And then both of those will kind of cool by Wednesday. So I'll do my inoculations on Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, I kind of package my mushrooms for the farmer's market. And then during that whole entire time frame, I'm constantly picking mushrooms and putting them in the cold storage. So it's really just um, staying consistent and having like a, a routine. It's very difficult to step away from the mushroom farm. So um, I have a couple friends that will babysit it for a couple days, but after that it gets out of hand. So that's why I chose to do a seasonal mushroom farm as well. Um, yep. That's Nolan. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think that it just depends on your schedule. Alright, any more questions? Another question was asking about your book. Okay. Oh, yeah, so the question is uh, yeah, about the book. So, um, yeah, so I wrote the, the book with the intent that it would, it was like kind of during COVID, so there was a lot of like online learning, and it has a lot of links to videos and links to products that I use, but it's essentially a start to finish guide on how to grow mushrooms for markets. Um, and kind of like at the scale that I was at. So about 100 pounds a week, which that's about 60 hours a week of labor. So kind of balance that out. But um, yeah, and then like I said before, I do teach uh, hands-on two-day cultivation courses. We have a couple spots left um, for our course in April. And then I'm teaching a uh, an outdoor gardening course in Arvada in May and then I think nothing until potentially in the fall I was trying to do some kind of DNA class but it's still pretty hazy at this point but um, yeah so the book is basically a, a guideline on how to get started and then if you want to learn more hands-on um, we do teach classes at our farm and then we also do uh, farm tours too. So that can all be found on our website. Um, but yeah, all right. Up, oh, go ahead. You mentioned breeding? Yep, so the question is, do I mention breeding or did I? Yeah, so, yep, so um, I kind of touched on it a little bit, but basically breeding is, <laughs> there's a few different methodologies. So the classical method of breeding mushrooms is to take spores and streak them out on a Petri dish and then select the strongest uh, culture that kind of emerges. One, one thing that I like to do is to isolate single spores. So you can do that by diluting spores or you can do that manually under the microscope. And then the advantage of isolating a single spore is that there's a chance that you can kind of uh, crop out a rare type of genetics that would otherwise be um, kind of outcompeted if you did it traditionally on a petri dish. So sometimes when you streak out spores, it could take six or eight days for one spore to germinate where if you isolate a single spore and put it on a dish 
and you could still capture that rare genetic. The problem is that it's very labor intensive and it's very um, material intensive. So in order to get, this is uh, my 30th rendition of cordyceps and it took about two years and maybe like 400 petri dishes just to get this little amount of success where if you're operating like a commercial farm, it's probably not the best allocation of resources. So um, kind of having a balance between that is my philosophy, but also um, like I was saying earlier, I kind of, my vision is to automate that process. So there's a lot of uh, like automated pipetters nowadays. You can buy fairly cheap, like two, $3,000 and you can kind of, uh, hone in that aspect for isolating spores and then you know, maybe make it more efficient. But yeah, so in nature, it just happens like randomly. And then up until recently, it traditionally was just, you take some spores up and just rub it on a Petri dish and then the strongest one survives. And then you select that and then you select that. But I think that you can almost like create a prism of genetics by selecting single spores and then combining them. Um, so I'm working on that and I'm kind of focusing on my next book, which will be more about breeding and selecting genetics and that kind of thing. Yep. So the question was, what am I looking to find for when I'm breeding? So for as a mushroom farm, I'm looking for yield, um, fast growth, uh, resistance to environmental changes, um, taste, like texture. Some mushrooms look really good, but then when you cook them down, they're like super hard. So um, that's like an undesirable trait. Um, just uh, like a peel. So at the farmer's market, everyone loves pink oysters because they just stand out and they're like, what is that? So um, creating like unique uh, phenotypes like that. Yep. Yep, yep go ahead. Uh, UF, uh, thanks, thanks for the very uh, educational presentation. Uh, uh, you have not mentioned reishi. Yep. Uh, have you ever tried grow them and is it any challenges, difficulties and why, why not? Yep, so the question is um, why didn't I mention reishi mushrooms? So um, I do grow them. I, I think they're very interesting. Um, I just didn't really think about it. But um, <laughs> So the challenges of growing reishi mushrooms are that they're very slow. So usually I'll start them maybe like now and then they'll be harvested in like late August, September. But they are a very unique mushroom because you can grow them um, in a high CO2 environment and they'll kind of grow like antlers. And then if you introduce them to more oxygen, they'll kind of uh, conk out and give you like the classical fan appearance. So there's a really talented grower called the fungi florist. If you look him up on Instagram, he creates art out of reishi mushrooms. I don't know how he does it, but he makes like zigzag ones and um, very, you know, very interesting grower. I recommend, you know, just checking his grows out. And um, the cool thing about reishi mushrooms is you can kind of preserve them just by like letting them dry out. It's almost like a form of art, like I said. and then. What I'll do is I'll take like a branch off and then grind it down and make a tea out of it. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of medicinal properties. I just think that it's kind of more of a niche mushroom. Um, so I have brought it to the farmer's market before and people will buy it, but it's very rare. So, yep. Yep, go ahead. So the question is, 
are there different um, nutrients? Is there a variation of nutrients between an outdoor mushroom and an indoor mushroom? I would say yes. Um, I haven't done like the official testing, but my instincts were when I first started growing mushrooms, I would uh, work with this company called CS Woods and they were like a specialty wood maker. So they would import all these like trees from South America. And I noticed like batch to batch when I was growing on some exotic hardwood compared to just like a cottonwood that I got from up north in Broomfield. Um, there is a difference in flavor and texture. So I personally think there's a, probably a difference in nutrition, but I never did the testing. But I think that um, as my farm kind of developed, it was so difficult to like isolate different types of sawdust and stuff. So then I just um, eventually converted over to pellets just because it was easy to reproduce over time but maybe someday I would revisit that and do like micro batches of different wood types. But I think that there's definitely a difference. I just, um, I kind of like glossed over it early on and then it's, uh, it's kind of hard to maintain that viability at the scale that I'm at. Thank you all very much. Um, I enjoyed answering your questions and talking mushrooms. So um, thanks for coming out here. And if you see me down in Castle Rock, we do the farmer's market every Saturday. Uh, we also sell to a crop share program in Arvada. Um, you can find all the information on our website. And yep, yeah, I'm sure I'll be at some meetings here soon too. So thank you very much. Definitely uh, check out his uh, the website. The Etsy's the, the the handle on Etsy is Fresh Fungi. Fresh Fungi. And so you can find a lot of uh, supplies and necessary materials. Um, so before we officially close, just a, a couple more mentions. Uh, just want to shout out Jay Bergler. Is Jay, is Jay here? He, he's our uh, 4A coordinator, and, and so 4As are going to be coming. Uh, just keep your eyes out. You know we're not there yet season-wise, but those are coming. Um, I also want to mention uh, a young woman you're going to be seeing a lot of in the next few years. Uh, Alexis Murray is our president-elect, and so after this year, she will be in charge. All right, yes. So Hello. get familiar with her. So. All right, thank you for coming. Um, oh, question. Any update on the book that's being worked on? Um, Ed, would you mind mentioning that there was a question about the book that's coming up? The book is out. Uh, it's available in several bookstores. Um, in the meantime, CMS has purchased 200 copies from the publisher. Uh, I would expect those will be available by next month, but John's kind of spearheading that, so I can't settle in much detail beyond that. Um, For those on Zoom, the question was about the, the book that is being published that, that CMS is, is, has contributed to. Um, book sellers like Amazon, you're saying? It's, I know it's on Amazon. Okay. Uh, the people who purchase it from some of the local bookstores also. But, but also through our website, that they can purchase it directly through our club and we get a piece of that. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. And, and, and Ed is going to be talking about that in June. 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 In June. Twenty five dollars per book. Per book. Also, Jim, I wanted to say I did get it our first four A set up. It's gonna be May eleventh. Oh. It's an urban four A and I'm gonna work on getting more set up. Awesome. So so urban four A coming uh, May eleventh. So keep keep your eyes out for, for more information. Thank you.
Thank you all. Good night, and uh, we'll see you next month. Next week, but oh, maybe yeah. just put a plug for yeah, that's, we're here. Oh, cool. 